please make him very welcome. She can do it on the other one. Thanks so much for this coming in today. And uh, tell us a little bit about Nature Play, how that started, and then how we can incorporate this tech, and, uh, giving the kids the opportunity to get down and get dirty as well and experiencing life. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for, for having me today. Now I'm going to try and find my way through to my presentation. Look, um, it's an interesting segue up to my talk with, with all the talk about technology. And I'm going to be talking about technology as well, but I'm going to be bringing some other perspectives into it. Um, something I think is really fundamentally important, though, to preface my talk with is that the whole idea of nature play, which is around the benefits of unstructured play outside, um, is that it's not as contrary to the idea of engaging with technology as it might seem. Um, we are a technological species. I was uh, out camping in the Karara rangelands a few weeks ago now, and I was out there with a, a fantastic um, guy who knew the land incredibly well, and as we were walking, he pointed out to me these little shards of stone that were the shards left from tool making from the, the Aboriginal people who had uh, occupied that land. And he showed me how to recognise that there's a percussive bulb. There's this sort of bulb in the stone where it's been hit with a force and that force has spread and it's sharded off. So we're there and we're finding these just everywhere we walk. It was unbelievable. Three days later, we get home, we're tired, we need a shower, hit up Uber Eats. So from stone tools to Uber Eats <laughs> in three days. And in the arc of our human history, you know, that, that progression from stone tools to Uber Eats, which is the highlight of human endeavour, <laughs> it's an incredibly short amount of time. So we are innately, inherently technological and social, but things are moving incredibly fast. So how do we, how do we allow that innate, important, uh, motivating part of being a human being, how do we allow that to thrive? How do we do that in a way that doesn't become consumed by a commercial drive? Because that's one thing about this occupying this digital space is that our kids aren't just occupying the digital space, they're largely and often occupying a commercial space. And that comes with challenges. And for us as parents and carers and adults who care about the development of our children, how we think about that whole process and that whole balance is one of the great challenges of this weird little quirk in history that we're occupying. So I'm gonna talk about some thoughts on that. Um, but I just want to make the point straight away that it's not that there's this idea of unstructured play in nature which is opposite to being in a coda dojo, that's opposite to, to thinking about the potential for technology to, to increase the way we learn. It's, they're part of the same thing. Um, there's a spectrum of how we think and how we engage and how we build that curiosity that allows us and, and you know, builds our learning. So the curiosity, the connection to other human beings, that's another fundamental part. Don't, it doesn't matter how curious you are, if you can't be a good classmate, if you can't be a good friend, if you can't interact with a, a co-worker, your ability to, to function and to thrive is, is limited. So there's these really core human things that we need to allow to develop, whether we're outside you know, looking at bees or inside on a, on a computer screen. So to that end, it's just a, a simple quote, that the whole question of screens and technology for kids now is not a question of do we have it or not. I mean, that boat has absolutely sailed. We are born into and in, immersed in this world. The question is, what do we use it for? How much do we use it? How early do we use it? And these are the, the really, some of the really important questions we sort of engage with. And I certainly don't pretend to have the answers. But I'm going to put up some questions for you. Um, just as we're thinking about this and thinking about stone tools to Uber Eats, I just want to put up a tiny little timeline. And I started at 2000 because my youngest daughter Zoe was born in 2000. And just thinking about what some of the things that have happened in this incredibly full little patch of time. 
So you can look through them, but essentially in 2000, only 3% of the population had access to usable de internet. And that's when she was born. MySpace launches a little bit later. We have a progression of different social media platforms. By 2007, we get to about 50% of people having access to really usable um, internet. It's not, and then in 2009, YouTube all of a sudden has got a billion users. So we go from 3% having access to the internet in 2000 to seven, nine years later, a billion people are using one platform. We're talking about a pretty dramatic jump happening here. 2014, more mobile devices than human beings. And something that I think is a really important one for us in dealing with children is that um, there was some research uh, last year pointing to the fact that by the fifth birthday, most children have had 1,500 photographs of them published through social media. When I read that, I started Googling, as you do, this is how you respond to the challenges. So I started Googling to try and find how many photographs were published of Marilyn Monroe in her lifetime. Now I couldn't find it, sadly. Google wasn't prepared for that particular question. But I'd be willing to bet that it was probably less than 1,500. And so this is a, a really interesting little tweak on, on how technology has evolved. So we've got children arriving at their fifth birthday, having been widely published. And not just published, it's not what they say, it's not what they do, it's how they look. And that may not be the intention of us publishing these photos, but a photograph captures us in a physical, visual way for us and others to look at. It's a mirror that stays permanently in that spot as you pass it in the morning. That's kind of a terrifying thing to think that these children are growing up so hyper aware of how they look and how other people are interpreting that. So these are some of the sorts of consequences and those platforms are commercial platforms. They come with a whole suite of calls to action, some of which are obvious and some of which are not. So in all of this, balance is a really important part of the equation. Um, Nature Play is currently involved, or we just recently had commissioned a survey of 1,000 Australian parents. The study that was funded by commercial interest, uh, OMO. Um, we get them dirty, they get them sparkly white, it's perfect, <laughs> everybody wins. But in the survey, one of the things we found was that um, in the average week, parents were reporting that their kids were spending 26 hours at school, 20 hours in front of screens away from school, six hours in play, outside play, um, and only 55% of parents said that their kids played outside every day. So we're seeing a really huge shift in the experience of childhood from even 2000 when, when Zoe was born. And you know, all parents, or the vast, vast majority of parents, identified screens as being the major barrier to play, to outside play. So obviously, there's other kinds of play. Um, now, when parents report on their children, they tend not to be entirely forthright. We tend to see the best and to, to exaggerate in our own favour. So I'd suggest that probably these numbers are, are even more than they're, they're suggesting here. One of the things, though, that's really come out for us in our thinking about screens is trying to shift it from purely being a discussion or, a, or thinking about children's screen use to thinking about adult screen use. Um, so we, we have a broad lack of awareness um, of parents of how much they're using their screens. We've talked about the publishing. Um, I also wanted to talk about the way that an excessive use of screens can impact conversation and shared language. There was a study back in 2012 that was reported in the Australian newspaper which speaks to that question. And what they found in this particular study was that in households where screens of all varieties were on for about two hours a day, that the occupants of that house would speak on average about 6,000 words to each other. So let's assume they're a, they're a nuclear family, there's four of them, you make that assumption, so about 1,500 words per person. Now in a household where screens were on at all times when people were home, 
what they found was that the occupants would speak an average of about 500 words to each other. Now, I'm sure they're communicating in other ways. They're communicating with their friends via Facebook. They're, there's all sorts of communication going on, but actual words, spoken language in that household has shifted down 125 words per person. Now, that is a loss. There are lots of wins, there are lots of gains to being in this moment of time when we have this incredibly powerful technology. But to have 125 words a day to introduce a child to the world, to me is a terrifying thing. And, and thinking about you guys as educators and what that means for you in receiving children whose home life is increasingly devoid of spoken language is a, is a concern. And, now there's, there's a little phrase or a little sequence of words that sort of sparks or highlights just how dangerous that is to me. Do you want toast or cereal? That's six words. So you've got 119 words left to talk about friendship groups, what was said, um, what you learned, what are you, what are you thinking about for next week, what do you want to do on the weekend, did you see that bird? Whatever it is, it's not a lot. Now I'm in the negative side of, of the technology question at the moment, bear with me. I'm gonna talk about some positives as well in a minute. Really interesting researcher, Dr. Mari Swingle um, in, the, in Canada, who's recently done some work and she's done a fantastic TEDx, I'd suggest you, uh, you have a look. But what she did was she was mapping brain function um, she's a, a practicing psychologist and a clinical researcher. She's written a book called I Minds, which is a, an interesting book. And what she was doing was mapping the brains of children who were being presenting or being brought in by their parents, um, saying that they, they were suffering from a screen addiction. And she mapped the function of those brains compared to normal brain function and the brain function of people with a series of, um, of ailments. And basically, the, the net result of her research was suggesting that where there's a really significantly excessive use of screens, that the impact on the brain is approximately the same as the impact of neglect. So if a child doesn't get sufficient love and nurture, they will start shutting down, neuronal pruning it's called, they'll start shutting down different parts of their brain function. <coughs> And she was witnessing the same thing occurring in these brains of these children spending way too much time um, on screens. So with that in mind, with all of that in mind, there are clearly some challenges and some risks to this incredibly powerful, potentially powerful and productive type of world we're in. And we'll find out more of them and some of them will prove to be exaggerations and some of them will be us gazing back at their own childhoods with rose-tinted glasses and, and will be ignored in time. Uh, but some of them will prove to be true and some of them will, will find out way too late. At Nature Play, though, we are very much of the opinion that the idea of trying to say no to screens is ridiculous and counterproductive and unfair. If you grow, if you're born into a culture and someone asks you to abandon that culture, to, to not have the frame of reference, to not be able to engage in, in the culture you're born into. That is a deeply unfair thing to ask. So when we're speaking to parents, we recommend kind of a three-step approach. Um, and it boils down like this. It's, uh, we encourage people to reduce their screen use. The idea of spending um, about two full waking days per week in front of a mobile device. Telstra did some research recently showing that 63% of children aged 3 to 17 in Australia either own or have permanent access to a mobile device and they spend an average of 23 hours a week on that device. If you wait 12 hours a day, that's two days out of seven on that device. We think that's probably too much. So we encourage people to reduce that use. We know it's hard and we know it will still be a big part of your life, but we encourage them to reduce it. We encourage them to try and replace sedentary games and sedentary and um, commercially driven activities with positive ones. 
and they can be, there are active technologies, there are apps that encourage you to get outside, um, there are ways of engaging with technology that are creative and, and productive. And the third one is we encourage people to balance that time engaging in that powerful world with engaging with the natural world and just being outside and playing, trying to get an even balance as much as possible. On the reduced side of things, um, we would encourage teachers to just to think about um, using screens where there's a learning benefit, not just as a matter of course. Um, I think it's very easy for us to be drawn along. Technology is changing all the time and there's an evolution of ideas. That's absolutely how it has to be and should be. But when that evolution of ideas is turbocharged by commercial interest, we do need to stop and check and, and be sure that we're doing things because they're a useful, productive, entertaining, fun, powerful thing and not just because they're there. Um, we, uh, apologies for the spelling mistake on the second point, um, we encourage schools to share information with parents about getting the screen balance right and also incorporate outdoor learning and play in a balanced way into your, into your teaching. Um, for parents, we really talk to them about those three R's, designated screen free places, using the available controls. It's been a really interesting development recently where we've seen the major tech companies introducing, so Google and, and Apple in particular, in the last few weeks, introducing significant controls into their uh, operating systems. So you can actually set limits on individual apps, you can schedule downtime, you can do the same with web routers and Wi-Fi. We replace, there's a suite of, of positive um, technologies out there. Common Sense Media is a fantastic place to look for reviews on them. And one that we have done, um, Nature Passport, so we're using screens to try and get kids away from screens, <laughs> perversely. Um, we actually got some funding from Disney to produce an app and we went off to Seattle and worked with an environmental education centre there and created an app that tries to use that screen to engage kids in outdoor play um, and there's a safari function where people, kids, go out and find living things, they photograph it, that gets contributed to citizen science, they get sent back um, uh, you know, identifications. One of the really interesting things, and I've just got to be cognizant of time, one of the really interesting things in doing that app, uh, project, so I was over in Seattle funded by Disney, working with an environmental education centre. And one of the things they did, Disney did, is they, they funded some time for one of America's leading consultants in the space. So this guy had been the lead consultant on Candy Crush. And he'd been the lead consultant on Dre's Beats earphones. So he suddenly really understood the market psychology and how to, how to motivate uh, people to engage with the product. So we sat down with him in a boardroom, way up high in Seattle, and the first thing he said is, you're not going to like me. He said, I'm going to encourage you to listen to me anyway. He said, what you need to know, what you need to understand, is that if your product is going to be anything other than something that's fleetingly glanced at and then ignored, your task, what you have to do, is to create anxiety. You have to build in moments of anxiety and then you need to offer solutions to that anxiety. Your call to action within the game or within your product is a solution to a moment of anxiety. If you don't create the anxiety, there'll be no motivation to act. Which makes me think in-app purchases are kind of a scary thing. <laughs> because not only is your money disappearing, but how that's being motivated is by a very intentionally addictive process, designing in anxiety for children. On the balance front, so you're trying to reduce screen time, you're trying to replace commercial and sedentary screen time with active and productive screen time, and then you're trying to balance whatever that screen time is with some time outside because it's good for us. So making time for play, hugely important. And another example to leave you, and I'm cognizant I need to wind up, 
Um, we're involved at the moment in a campaign called Apple Classroom Day, where we're encouraging schools and early learning centres to take the 1st of November as a day to get outside and, and deliver your <coughs> curriculum, do all the components of your day as much as you can outside. 254,000 kids around the country have been registered for that. 513 WA schools and early learning centres have signed up for it. As of today, it'll be, it'll be more by the time I get back to the office. So there is a, a movement and a momentum for that. In doing that, technology can be a partner in that. There is no reason why you can't take mobile technologies out into the field and incorporate them into components of that time. Just the very fact that it's done through a website, registered through the website. I mean, I spend an extraordinary amount of time in front of my screen um, encouraging people to get away from screens. <laughs> A few useful resources to leave you with, um, websites typically, but broadly before I wind up or as I wind up, I just want to reiterate the point that we live in an incredibly, and both the previous presenters have said it, we live in really fast changing, fast paced, fast changing times and there is so much benefit to this time. And in so many ways, the challenges we find around screen time are absolutely wonderful challenges to have. They're, they're first world problems. We, we are blessed with incredible affluence, with incredible tools at our disposal. Um, and our challenge is how do we introduce more play? How do we introduce more nature into that? And what a fantastic challenge. We're not dragging kids through the snow out of Kosovo. We're not digging up potatoes out of barren fields in Germany after World War II, we, look, we're, we have a wonderful challenge, but a real challenge, and that's how do we live in this technological world, embrace it, get the most out of it, but not leave behind in the process all the other incredible benefits of nature, um, of being a human being in nature. Thanks very much.